All right. Archaeology. Uh, archaeology in the Bible is a, a very interesting subject, at least to me. And archaeology, it's important in biblical studies for a lot of indirect reasons. You know, there, there are a lot of indirect reasons why we want to look at that. That's not going to be my focus, but I at least wanted to note that it's important for indirect reasons. It not only shines light on the geographical and cultural and political and religious backgrounds of biblical text, so you can kind of get a sense of what is the ancient world like. So it's almost like exploring another planet. So you, you, it sheds light on what, what did they believe, how did they act, what things did they do, what were their customs, all of which helps when you're trying to understand the biblical text. But it also helps uh, these t ancient texts that we have found help us in understanding biblical languages. Like you have cognate languages, like Ugaritic. And so you find their language and then it helps you in understanding, well, here's an obscure Hebrew word and then maybe we can see that it's, a, it's derived from a Ugaritic word or they come from a common word, so it sheds light on that. And it also sheds light on textual criticism. So like, for example, the Dead Sea Scrolls. When you have the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have very early manuscripts which then help us determine what did the inspired writer actually write. Because as you know, you have copies that get made and errors can creep into copies, so you have to say, well, what was the original text? And that's the art or science of textual criticism. But my focus in the class is going to be on archaeological finds that have a more direct uh, significance. So here are some of, the, some of the major texts that have indirect importance for biblical studies. I hope you're familiar at least with some of these. But you see the text in the Amarna letters that were discovered in Tel El Amarna in Egypt. You have the Ebla tablets from Tel Mardik in Syria. The Mari tablets from Tel Hariri in Syria. The Nuzi tablets from Yorgen Tepe in Iraq. The Ugarit archives from Rosh Shamra in Syria. The Bogoskoi tablets I'm going to say a little bit about in a minute. Uh, in Turkey, you of course have the Dead Sea Scrolls from Qumran in Israel and you have these silver amulet scrolls uh, from Jerusalem. And that's really just a very small thing, but it, it predates the Dead Sea Scrolls by hundreds of years, and it's a text, I think, of numbers. So it's significant in that regard. So all of these have, are important for these indirect reasons that I mentioned. But like I say, what I want to focus on in the class are finds that have a more direct connection to the Bible. Now, I may stray a bit from that. That's just how I am. I may stray a bit from that narrow focus, especially in my discussion of Israel and Egypt, but for the most part I'm concentrating on finds that connect to specific people, places, and events that are mentioned in Scripture. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a more direct connection than these general kinds of things for which archaeological finds are useful. Now, I don't include discoveries of biblical towns, and cities and people groups, unless there's something additional that, in my judgment, makes those finds particularly noteworthy. And I'm going to begin with finds that are relevant to the patriarchal period, and then we'll just work our way forward chronologically. And as I say, my guess is it's going to take eight to ten weeks, but uh, I'm notoriously bad at that, but that's what I think. And then we'll pick up something else for the remainder of the next quarter. Now, first, I wanted to give you a chronology, a biblical chronology. I don't know if you can see that. I hope you can see it. I know it's small, but I couldn't blow it up really any bigger. But here is a pretty standard biblical chronology. The first section I want to look at is from Abraham, who's born in 2166, down to Jacob's going into, uh, into Egypt in 1876. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about how do we, why is this standard chronology? How do we wind up getting this? And you know, why do you claim that Abraham's born in 2166 B.C.? And how did that become a standard thing? So I wanted to say a little bit about that quickly. And a, a very important datum in chronology like this is the idea and, and the conclusion that Solomon began to build his temple in 966 B.C. Okay, once you have that fixed point, it's very significant, as I'm going to explain in a minute. You say, okay, I can see how having an absolute date, 966 B.C. for Solomon beginning to build the temple, I can see how having an absolute date would be very important. But how do you get that date? 
How do you wind up figuring that out? Well, the Battle of Karkar. Karkar is a very famous battle in ancient history that involved the Assyrians. And the Battle of Karkar can be reliably dated to 853 BC. And you say, well, how can it be reliably dated? Okay. Well, a very important aspect of that reliable dating is a solar eclipse that is reported in Assyrian records during the ninth year. So the Assyrian records say that during the ninth year of the Assyrian king, Ashurdan III, there was a solar eclipse in Assyria. And so you can run the celestial mechanics backwards, and you can determine then the precise date on which that solar eclipse that is reported occurred. And it occurred on June 15, 763 BC. So now that we know that the ninth year of Asher Dan III's reign was 763 BC, we then can take the Assyrian chronologies of the preceding rulers and we can work back from that absolute date to get absolute dates, for example, of the reign of Shalmaneser III, who was the king who was fighting on Assyria's side during the Battle of Karkar. So we can go back and we can see his reign and date his reign, and we can date the Battle of Karkar because he mentions the year of his reign in which he fought the battle. So we start here, we get this, this period of 853 B.C., where we wind up saying, okay, that battle's important. You say, all right, well, that gives us a chronology of Assyria. How do we jump over into a chronology of Israel or a chronology of the southern kingdom of Judah? You got me over here. How do I make contact with the chronologies in Israel? Glad you asked. Because we know, we know that Ahab was ruling in Israel at the time of the Battle of Karkar. Now, how do we know that? We know that because in this, the annals of his campaign, in, a, in an artifact, an archaeological artifact called the Stela of Shalmaneser III, also known as the Kirk Stela, which we'll talk about later. But there he identifies by name Ahab as one of his opponents. So we know that he's fighting Karkar in 853 B.C., and we know that in 853 B.C., Ahab is reigning on the throne of the northern kingdom of Israel. You remember Israel split, the United Kingdom, after Solomon's death? You have Israel to the north, Judah to the south. So we know that in 853, Ahab's on the throne there in the king of Israel. All right. Now we also know from another archaeological find, an artifact known as the Black Obelisk of Shalmaneser, which I'll talk about later. But we also know from that that in a military campaign he conducted in his 18th year, which is 841 B.C., we know that the Israelite king Jehu paid him tribute. So we then know, all right, we know Ahab's on the throne of Israel in 853. We know that Jehu is on the throne of Israel in 841. And we also know from Scripture that 12 years separates the reigns of Ahab and Jehu because there were two intervening kings whose reigns totaled 12 years. Okay? So we then know... That was the last year of Ahab, 8, 853 B.C., and 841 was the first year of the reign of Jehu. So from that, we then work backward. So we know that Ahab's last year of his reign is 853. I now, from the chronologies of the Israelite kings, I can now work backward, and I get to see that at 931, 930, that is when the first Israelite king, Jeroboam, came to the throne. Okay, well, that's significant. Why? Because Jeroboam came to the throne, what, in the year of Solomon's death. So now I make contact with the Judean chronologies because I know that, I know that Jeroboam comes to the throne in 931, 930. That's the year that Solomon died. And so now I have Solomon dying in 931, 930. And we know Solomon reigned for 40 years. So we know that he began his reign in 971, 971 or 970. Let's take 970. He began his reign there, and 1 Kings 6, 1 says Solomon began to build the temple in the fourth year of his reign. So now we're at 966 B.C. Okay, so that's how we wind up getting. How do you know that, that the temple was begun in 966? I said that's a very important absolute dating point. Now, once we have that, where we have that the temple was begun, we know that the Exodus was in 1446. We know that because 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1 says Solomon began to build the temple 
480 years after the Exodus. He began to build the temple in 966. 480 years before that, you get 1446. So we have that date. Now then we can also determine from that the beginning of Israel's sojourn in Egypt. When Jacob and the Israelites entered into Egypt. How do we do that? Well, we know, we know that from Exodus chapter 12, verses 40 to 41, that the Israelites were in Egypt for 430 years before the Exodus. So we know the Exodus was in 1446. We go 430 years before that, and we're at 1876. So that's when he went in. And then we get to Abraham's birth, 2166. We know that because Genesis 47, 9 says Jacob was 130 years old when he went to Egypt. We've already figured out when he went to Egypt, that's 1876. He was 130 years old. So then we know that he was born in 2006. Genesis 25, 26 says Isaac was 60 when Jacob was born. Jacob's born in 2006. Isaac's born in 2066. And Genesis 21, 5 says Abraham was 100 when Isaac was born. So Abraham was born in 2166. That's how this becomes standard. Okay. I don't know if you care about that, but I wanted to run through that for you. Okay, so that's the chronology. That's why we're using that. Now, I wanted to mention, first I'm looking at the patriarchal period. This is Abraham 2166 until Jacob and his family go into, go into Egypt in 1876. And there's not a lot there. Uh, there's not a lot there. The first thing I want to mention is the Bogoskoy tablets, and they don't really belong there. But I'll tell you why I'm going to mention that anyway. The Old Testament, it refers to two different groups of people as Hittites. There's this group that settled in Palestine prior to Abraham's arrival, particularly around Hebron. And these are people who are descendants of Canaan through Heth. That's one group referred to as Hittites. And then there's a group whose kingdom centered in modern Turkey, and it extended down into Syria, okay, up north of Israel. So they're also called Hittites. Now, the first group of Hittites is mentioned in connection with Abraham, beginning in Genesis chapter 15, and the second group is referred to in Joshua chapter 1, verse 4, and several other later texts. So we have two groups of people referred to as the Hittites. Now, I mentioned the Bogusgoy tablets here because just over a century ago, which isn't really a lot, lot, all that long ago. The older I get, it's like it'll be tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. But just over a century ago, you had some scholars suggesting that the Hittites... They were a fictional creation of the biblical writers. This is what people do a lot. Uh, you know, this book's junk. It's just written by people. And so you have all these references to Hittites in here. Ah, that was just, you know, they didn't exist. These people just made them up and wrote it. And, and why do they think that? Well, they think it because they don't believe the Bible. But they said, look, there's no extra biblical evidence of the Hittites' existence. Don't you think that if there had been, for example, this Hittite group that had had this kingdom and all this, that we'd know something about it? Do you know, do you know how, how advanced we are and how into it we are? So certainly we'd know something about it. Okay, so you had people just over a century ago saying that the Hittites were a figment of the inspired writer's imagination. But in the early 20th century, 1906, I believe, you have thousands of tablets discovered by a guy named Hugo Winkler at a town called Bogoskoy, which was ancient Hattusha, which is in Turkey, about 130 miles east of Ankara. Now, the language of those tablets was deciphered in 1915 by a guy named Bidrik Razni, which revealed that these tablets were the royal archives of Hittite kings from the 14th and 13th centuries B.C., Okay, so though this is later than Abraham, and these probably are not the Hittites mentioned in connection with Abraham, the fact some Hittites are mentioned in connection with Abraham made me choose this as the place to bring to your attention this classic failure of modern skepticism. It's not the only one. You have, you'll have a number of things where they talk about some of these uh, kings. Now, these kings never existed. Well, there's his palace. Okay, but I just wanted to bring that to your attention here. Now, the only thing really that I have from Abraham's time is the Abraham family tomb. Now, you know the cave or the field of Machpelah? That's the burial place 
of at least Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebekah, Jacob, and Leah. And you see all of that in Genesis in a number of different places. Rachel wasn't buried there. You remember that. Because of her sudden death during childbirth near Bethlehem. So that's Genesis 35, 19. Now this tomb is fairly certainly, it's not 100%, but it's fairly certainly located at the site of the Muslim mosque known as Haram el Khalil. And here is a picture of this mosque. Now why do you think it's fairly certainly located there? Well, in the first century B.C., now that's long after the patriarchs, I understand that. But do you see that things like tombs, especially a tomb of this significance to these people, would stay in the cultural memory for a long time? Because people would know where this was. In the first century B.C., King Herod was so convinced of the location of this place that he built a wall around the area. And he erected monuments in honor of the patriarchal figures. A church was built on that site in the 5th or 6th century. And this happens a lot of times. When you, you have some site that has some connection to biblical people, churches get built on them. And that's just how it is. I don't know if, we, if that's how we'd roll today. But, you know, it, back in the day, they built churches on these things because they said, look, this is a, this is a spot of some religious significance. And so they were built. So in the 5th or 6th century, you had a church built on that site. That church was later converted into a mosque. That mosque was converted back into a church, and that church was once again converted into a mosque. And that is this mosque that you see right here. Now, the underground chambers, where the patriarchal figures would have been entombed, they've received very little investigation. Now, the first recorded exploration of the cave was done by Augustinian monks in 1119. Okay, 1119, so that's a good long time, but that's the first recorded exploration of the cave or the tombs themselves. And then in 1967, after the Six-Day War, the Israeli Moshe Dayan lowered a 12-year-old girl with a flashlight into the underground chamber. And she recorded and described an arrangement that was very similar to the layout that the monks had described in the 12th century. But that's all we know really about it. But that is, is most likely this is in fact the cave of Machpelah right there. And that's really all that we have. I mean, you know, we, have, we know where Ur is and the excavations have been done at parts of Ur and that kind of thing. But that's too distant for me to want to talk about here. The next thing I want to talk about, the next long section I want to talk about is Israel's sojourn in Egypt. Okay, so we have this, this is when Jacob and the family moved there in 1876 until you have the Exodus in 1446. So I want to talk about that. As I already indicated, you see these, the chronologies, you can get, you can be certain about the chronologies, they can be dated because you have certain securely dated anchor points. You get certain uh, absolute dates, and then you can work from those. So you see that in the biblical chronology. Uh, you can get those dates. Now, with less certainty, one can also establish an absolute chronology for the reigns of the various Egyptian pharaohs. There's a little wiggle room in there, but you can do the same kind of thing, and you can establish absolute dates for the reigns of these pharaohs. The archaeologist Douglas Petrovich who has spent a lot of time working in this, and he's now working on a book that he hopes to have finished by, by November or published out next year. But he's working on this. He spent a lot of time doing this. And he argues in detail for an Egyptian chronology that fits very neatly with the biblical storyline, and I'll go through that. But I want you to first see, here's, here's his Egyptian chronology. And you see here the reigns, the dynasties. You get the 12th, the 15th, 18th. Uh, these are the ones that are most significant, particularly down here you see Amenhotep II. So he has him, and these are his, his reigns that he has of the various pharaohs. Now what is important, one of the significant things is I want you to recognize is that Petrovich's proposed Egyptian chronology is within the bounds of mainstream archaeology and Egyptology. Okay, that's significant. In other words, he's not arguing 
you have radical skeptics, people like David Roll and John Bimson, who argue that the, that the conventional Egyptian timeline is radically skewed, that it's off by hundreds of years. Okay, well, that's a much, much more difficult case to make. Okay, he's not in that category. His timeline and chronology of the Egyptian pharaohs is something it, he bases on, on historical evidence for dating the reigns of these, but his dates would, be, uh, would find support among mainstream archaeologists and Egyptologists. For example, his reigns for the 18th dynasty, which we're going to focus on a lot because that's the period of the Exodus. Okay, but his, his dates for the reigns of the pharaohs in the 18th dynasty, it varies by just a few years from those given in the Cambridge Ancient History, which, as Eugene Merrill says, is a publication produced by impartial scholars and recognized as impeccable authority. Richard Lobbin, who's a professor of anthropology and African studies at Rhode Island College, he says in his book, Historical Dictionary of Ancient and Medieval Nubia, he says here he dates the reign of this key figure, Amenhotep. Well, you see, Petrovich has him at 1455. Lobbin has him at 1453 or 1450 down to 1425 or 1419. Okay, Petrovich has him at 1418. Now, Petrovich, he defends, so you see that this is, the, he moves the standard chronology just slightly, just a couple of years, and he defends this. He, he explains it and justifies it in a paper. You could see the paper if you would go to my website. I have a paper on Israel, Egypt, and the Exodus. And in that paper, I cite Petrovich's paper, which is online, and you can go and read his arguments of why he says it is legitimate and there's a little wiggle room that allows him to properly and justly slide that two years. Okay, so I, but I want you to see the important thing is to see that he's in the mainstream. All right, tweaking. He's not radically altering. And you get a lot of people who, who, who try that, and uh, like I say, that's going against a strong current. Now you see that, that Abraham entered Canaan. Here's the chronologies together. Okay, so now we have the biblical chronology over here, and we have Petrovich's Egyptian chronology here. Okay, and you, you see here that Abraham, he entered Canaan in, in 2091. And that's over two centuries, 215 years before Jacob's family moved into Egypt in 1876. So they dwell there in the promised land. They dwell there, dwell there in tents in the region, and they were predominantly keepers of livestock. Okay, they're keepers of livestock, but since Lot, who like Abraham, he had flocks and herds, and yet he lived in the city of Sodom, it's possible that other descendants of Abraham were living in cities. But in any event, what I want you to see is that they lived among the various people groups in Canaan for a long time. And they no doubt absorbed or added aspects of Canaanite culture to the Mesopotamian culture that Abraham and his family had brought with them. Now, this is before the giving of the Mosaic Law. You'll see a point why I'm telling you this. Because this is relevant to how do you identify Israelites in Egypt. How distinctive are they from other Canaanites? That's important. Okay? And so this, his, this time where they are in Canaan before they go into Egypt, this is before the giving of the Mosaic Law. Okay? Which Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 14, Paul describes the Mosaic Law as a dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. In other words, the Mosaic Law, it isolated and separated Israelites from the surrounding culture which made them more distinctive and thus potentially more readily identifiable in the archaeological record. Okay, so this is before that. You see, after the Mosaic Law, they are, they are more distinctive and so you have the potential that you would more readily be able to identify them in the archaeological record because of those distinctions. But this is before that. 
Okay, this is before that. So those distinctives of later Israelite culture, they weren't part of patriarchal life and are thus not available as markers of Israelite presence. So that's one thing. Moreover, given the, the kindness and the goodwill that Jacob's family was shown by Pharaoh, right? they were treated very well when they come in. They come into Egypt. Well, given that kindness and goodwill, one can imagine that the Israelites were favorably disposed to Egyptian culture. In other words, it wouldn't be like these people are horrible. Well, they, well they're really fine. They have treated us well. So it wouldn't be a stretch to say they were favorably disposed to Egyptian culture, so you could see the potential then for some intermingling of that. And when you add to that the fact that the Israelites in Egypt, they engaged in idol worship. And you can see that in Joshua 24, 14. You can see it in Ezekiel 20, 5 to 10, 23, 3. And while you're at it, you also ought to look at uh, Exodus 32.1, Leviticus 17.7, Psalm 106.7, and Acts 7.39-43. When you add that fact in, it becomes very difficult to distinguish Israelites by archaeological remains from other Canaanite groups that may have been in Egypt. You see, it's just not, it's just not that easy. To say, well, I can tell that these archaeological remains are not only Canaanite, but they're specifically Israelite. What did that mean at that time? You see, what would that have meant? And that puts a different light on the frequent charge that's leveled that there's no evidence of Israelites in Egypt. Let me read to you what the archaeologist, a well-known archaeologist, James Hoffmeyer, he says, archaeology's ability to determine the ethnicity of a people in the archaeological record, especially of the Israelites at such an early period, is quite limited. Assuming the Israelites were in Egypt during Egypt's new kingdom, 1540 to 1200 BC, well, they were gone by then, but he's a late Exodus guy, okay? But in any event, his point still stands. What kind of pottery would they have used? What house plans would they have lived in? What sort of burial tradition? See the kinds of things we can find with archaeology. What, ki what kinds of burial traditions did they practice? And would archaeologists be able to identify the burial of these early Israelites who ended up as slaves anyway? And how are all these things different from those of Canaanites or other Semitic-speaking peoples in Egypt at this time? And that's something really to keep in mind when we're looking at these things. Now, the fact the Israelites were concentrated in the damp eastern delta region of Egypt, the fact that they were there, uh, it was called the land of Ramesses in Genesis 47, 11. It's called Goshen in Genesis 45, 10 and a number of other texts. Well, that makes it very unlikely that you're going to get any papyrus writings documenting their presence. In other words, that you're going to have some kind of document, a papyrus document that says, oh, here they are, these people from Israel, and they're doing this and that, okay? Uh, or Abraham's people, or however you want to characterize them. It's very unlikely you're going to do that because of the climate there. I mean, after more than 35 years, Manfred Bietek, he has excavated at Tel El Daba, which is right here. He has ex excavated there for 35 years found zero papyri. Edward Push, Edgar, I'm sorry, Push, he excavated 25 years at the sister site of Cantier. Zero papyri. Well, why? Because it's wet. And the stuff just deteriorates and dissolves. All right, so you say, all right, how do we determine who are Israelites from other generic Canaanites? archaeologically, at this time? How do we do that? Do we have records? Well, looks like we don't have records because they're, they are concentrated in this land of Goshen in this damp eastern delta region. Well, so what about carved monuments? Well, it would be surprising to find a reference to, a, to foreign inhabitants, especially those who eventually became slaves and who were associated with the humiliating defeat of the Exodus. It would be very unusual to find monuments to these people or mentioning these people because even if such monuments had existed, 
they probably would have been systematically destroyed or removed, as was done in the case of Queen Hatshepsut, as we'll talk about later. So they weren't above doing that. So even if you had a reason that you would, you would put them on a monument, after all that happened, they would have probably been systematically removed. The renowned Egyptologist, a guy named Kenneth Kitchen, he makes the point with regard to a later pharaoh. Kitchen is writing with regard to 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verses 9 through 15, and Kitchen says, no pharaoh ever celebrates a defeat. If Osorkin, Osorkin won, had ever sent out a Zira, the Cushite, with resulting defeat, no Egyptian source would ever report on such an incident, particularly publicly. The lack to date of external corroboration in such a case is itself worth nothing in terms of judging history. Now, this guy's an Egyptologist, and he's saying the fact you wouldn't find evidence of this thing that's reported in Second Chronicles, he says that's worth nothing because you wouldn't expect to find evidence. Do you think these people are going to go and, and talk about this? That's not how they rolled. Okay, so, that's it. so I, I wanted you to have all of this background and understand all of this as we, these limitations, as we go and explore some of these things. Now, with those limitations in mind, the excavations that have been done for over 35 years at that site, Tel El Daba, are far more significant than is often realized. This site right here. I don't know if you can read that. It's an eye test. Tel El Daba. But they're more significant than is often recognized. That site, it was occupied for centuries, during which time it expanded, and it became known by different names throughout those centuries. It was first known as Rauity, then it was known as, as Avaris, then Perinefer, and then Ramesses. So you have this thing for centuries, this site, occupied, expanding, and going by different names. Okay, that, that's, that's significant. Now, the excavations they show, the excavations that have been done here show that in the mid-19th century B.C., this is right when uh, Jacob and his family are coming in. They come in in 1876. Okay? So in the mid-19th century B.C., Right around the time that Scripture says Jacob and his family moved to Egypt, there was an influx of people from Canaan to this location. So you have, the, you have this influx going on right around then. Now, the people from Canaan who inhabited the site, they are sometimes referred to in the literature. If you read this, you'll see this. They're referred to as Asiatics. Well, you know, I'm thinking when I see that, I'm thinking Vietnam or something, you know. That's not what it meant. Asiatics, that was a catch-all category that the Egyptians used to describe inhabitants of two places. The Levant, which is Palestine and Syria, and Mesopotamia. So they used Asiatics to refer to inhabitants of the Levant and inhabitants of Mesopotamia. So it was kind of a catch-all general term. Now, the Asiatics at Tel El Daba, for various reasons, are understood to have come from the Levant. Okay, that area that encompasses Canaan, not from Mesopotamia. That they are understood, for various reasons, to have come from the Levant. Okay, so that area that's right there that, it, that encompasses Canaan. Manfred Bitek, who's the lead excavator at the site, he describes the site as, quote, a settlement constructed at the beginning of the 12th dynasty and completely resettled by Canaanites from the late 12th dynasty onwards. So this is right at the time, you see, when you have the Israelites coming in. This is what he's saying, Canaanites, not Mesopotamians, Canaanites are coming in into Egypt here. Archaeologist Bryant Wood, he says here of the, uh, says of the 19th century settlement that has been excavated at Tel El Daba, he says about 82 acres in size, 
It was unfortified, although there were many enclosure walls, most likely for keeping animals. The living quarters consisted of small rectangular buildings built of sand bricks. Neutron activation analysis. I could probably get Dallas to go off on that, but it's just a way of, you know, they're able to determine the specific uh, precise makeup of something. Okay, but he says here, neutron activation analysis indicates that Palestinian type pot pottery from the village originated in southern Palestine. So they said, well, how about this? The pottery that we see here in this mid 19th century BC Canaanite place, it originated from southern Palestine. I think that's significant. He says, and BTEC, Manfred BTEC, notes that the presence of handmade cooking pots is evidence of a nomadic pastoral population. He further observes that these foreigners could not have settled there without Egyptian consent. Of course they couldn't have. They couldn't have settled there without Egyptian consent. About 20% of the pottery that is found at the, at the site, at the settlement, about 20% of that was of Palestinian type, and 50% of the male burials there from this time 50% of the male burials included weapons of Syrian-Palestinian type. Okay, not Egyptian, Syrian-Palestinian type. The largest building in this community, the largest building there was a house of six rooms that was laid out in a horseshoe fashion around an open courtyard. And that floor plan is identical to the later four-room houses that you see in Palestine. So that seems like a significant connection that you have there. Now, the villa evidently belonged to an official of some kind, and it's conceivable. You can't prove it, of course, but it's certainly conceivable that after his administrative duties related to the famine, that Joseph moved to Tel El Daba, known then as Rawati, that he moved there to be with his family. And if that happened, that prominent house could be his. Now, that would be significant. Now, one of the tombs in the village cemetery, it included a large statue. It's one and a half to two times uh, normal size, life size. But it includes this large statue of a seated Asiatic dignitary here at Tel El Daba. Now, the statue was deliberately destroyed. Somebody had just gone crazy on it and busted it all up. It was deliberately destroyed, and fragments of it were found in two separate tombs. Actually, fragments were found in more than two tombs, but only two of those tombs were large enough to have accommodated the original statue. So the st don't know which of the two tombs housed the original statue, but you found it there in, in two of those tombs. Bryant Wood says of the statue, this archaeologist, he says, the likeness was of a seated official, one and a half times life size. It was made of limestone and exhibited excellent workmanship. The skin was yellow, the traditional color of Asiatics in Egyptian art. It had a mushroom-shaped hairstyle painted red, typical of that shown in Egyptian artwork for Asiatics. A throw stick the Egyptian hieroglyph for a foreigner was held against the right shoulder. The statue had been intentionally smashed and defaced. Well, here you see a reconstruction of this statue. I doubt it, it may be so light, you might not. But see, this is all gone. So what you have, you have these parts, the shoulder and the foot, and the rest of it's all scattered around. So that's it. That, that is one reconstruction where you see he's holding the throw stick. You simply have this part of his hand. And so whoever did this reconstruction had him holding the throw stick with his right hand. An alternative reconstruction is here, where he's holding the throw stick in his left hand. But you see here, this is, this is something of the sense of this statue that was in this tomb of this Asiatic dignitary in this place in uh, Egypt, in the Delta, right when they were there. And the tombs are dated to around 1805, which is the date of, uh, of his death the date of Joseph's death. So that's something very, very significant. Now, the Asiatic community at Tel El Daba, it grew quickly. So you have, the, you have an initial settlement there, and this it grows quickly in the mid-19th century, and then it spreads eastward, and around 1670, do I have, okay, around 1670, 
There's another group of Asiatics. That's these guys, the Hyksos. Around 1670, there's another group of Asiatics. They occupied an adjoining area to the northeast of where we have these prior Asiatics who've been living there for a long time, since the middle of the 19th century BC. Then in around 1670, we've got these, this new group of Asiatics who come, the Hyksos, and they're right in an adjoining area northeast of where these guys are, the, the first set, and they seized control of the Egyptian government. They took control of the Egyptian government in, the, in Lower Egypt, in Northern Egypt. So they became the rulers there of the government. And the site was by then called Avaris, and it served as the center of this Hyksos dynasty, complete with a substantial palace complex that they built. And so here they are, right here, with these prior Canaanites, Asiatics, who'd been living there for a long time. They come there. They take control of the Egyptian government, certainly in Lower Egypt, and they're there in, in that section. Now, the Hyksos in this earlier group of Asiatics that I'm suggesting to you are Israelites. Now, the Hyksos in this earlier group of Asiatics, they coexisted and they prospered at Avaris throughout the Hyksos approximately 110-year reign. You see they go from 1670 down to about 1560. So here we know archaeologically from the work done by BTEC at this site at Tel El Daba, you see that they're there and they're existing together through that reign. The Israelites had been there long before. Here come, here come some more Asiatics. They seized control. And somehow we're able to distinguish these Asiatics from the others. Okay, so we know who the Hyksos are. We know where they are and they're building this palace. Now that goes on. I heard that bell. But that goes on and then we're going to have this ruler, this pharaoh from southern Egypt, he's way down in Thebes. He comes up and he winds up expelling the Hyksos. Okay, and that's where we'll have to pick up the story next because the archaeological thing, if I can show you this, this is where we're headed. And this is the archaeological uh, diagram pre prepared by the excavators that I've just tweaked just a little bit in terms of the date to bring them more in line with uh, Petrovich's date. But I want to talk to you about this and show you what this shows in terms of, see, these are the prior uh, Canaanites, Israelites. This is the occupation of the eastern sides by the Hyksos. You see they're coexisting. These are the Egyptians, and then we have this blank. The Egyptians take this over with Akmos, and they build their own palace right where these guys had their palace and you have this blank, but these guys are still around because they're gonna be serving as slaves to build this. Uh, okay, uh, thanks for coming.